Hi folks, welcome to the webinar. My name is Dan Malinger from Think Big Analytics. And I'm joined today with Will Rampala from Kantar Media. And, uh, Hello to everyone. Yeah, Will, can you advance the slide one? Experiencing a little technical difficulty on my side. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> so as I mentioned, folks, I'm representing Think Big Analytics. So we're a pure play services firm in the big data space. We've been labeled as one of the fastest growing big data startups. We're headquartered in Mountain View. Uh, we have offices and additional offices in Salt Lake City, Chicago, Boston, an additional presence in New York City and Austin, Texas. Our firm is really focused on three main priorities, technology, working with folks to really achieve success over with velocity and big data, data science, really working with teams to extract value and insight out of data sets through big analytics. And finally, we have an education wing of the firm that helps firms really understand what they can do with big data, get their skills up to date, transition the skills they have today into those that are necessary to really be successful with big data. So the title of this webinar is Digital Marketing in the Cloud. And we're gonna walk through a big data use case of collecting and creating value from video ad beacon data. Throughout this webinar, if you have any questions at all, please just type them in and uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Will who's gonna tell us a little more about the use case and how Kantar Media came to realize they needed a big data solution for video ad data. Will? Great, uh, thanks a lot, Dan. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just, a, just a quick uh, section about me and, and, and why I'm here. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually uh, just, a, just a customer, um, uh, but um, um, I'm actually with uh, Kantar Media. Um, I'm the Vice President of Production and Systems, and uh, the area of responsibility for Kantar Media is in uh, data collection of advertising activity. Um, my, uh, well, my, my, my actual responsibility area is, uh, revolves around the internet, both online advertising, online video advertising, as well as traditional print, magazine, newspapers, uh, and uh, billboards, et cetera. Um, just to give you a little bit of perspective who we are, I have a couple things in here about us. Um, Kantar Media, um, we're actually part of WPP. Uh, the world's largest holding company. Um, so really, we're uh, we're part of a family that is all about advertising, uh, advertising agencies um, uh, primarily. Uh, but we're on the uh, we're on the intelligence side. Um, uh, you know, we are um, we monitor pretty much everything that happens um, everywhere. Of course, you know, so we know everything about uh, what's going on out there. At least we try to. Uh, we do actually have the largest advertising database in the world. We we do. Um, under the Kantar Media umbrella, we do uh, act in, in uh, more than 20 countries. Uh, we we monitor pretty much all activity uh, that we can find out there um, across uh, 26 different media. Um, when we talk about North America, when we talk about North America, where we fit in, um, we fit in one of the family of companies that uh, uh, that do advertising intelligence. Um, our sister companies that we work with and, and we share our data with, though, are uh, we have things that are verticals for you know healthcare, political advertising, coupon uh, redemption, um, audience measurement, and things like that. So uh, under uh, to, to just want to give you some perspective on that, so you can understand where we're coming from uh, on this particular use case. Um, we have. Um, as part of our monitoring that we do on the online activity, um, one of the areas, of course, is uh, video uh, for online video advertising. Now, we, 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 the way we currently do that um, is we have um, a very large, uh, we, we, we take a sampling approach, a statistically significant sample uh, of um, advertising activity by using a, uh, a video uh, spider proprietary technology that we, we have developed our, uh, ourselves that goes out and, and, um, uh, and truly um, behaves as a, as a consumer um, and uh, tags the uh, online video advertising exposure that it, that it receives. Now, in the, the case that we had, we were working with um, uh, one of the largest uh, video uh, online portals, um, and it turns out that um, 
we wanted to make sure that we were monitoring uh, the activity on their site, um, and it's it's important um, it's important for them because from a, from a publisher standpoint, they want to make sure that their advertising activity is seen by us because uh, we are the uh, we're the metric that people use to uh, determine where they should be placed their advertising. <laughs> um, we we can be a third party um, a disinterested third party uh, that. Um, uh, that we that you can use as a uh, as a metric or a currency to say um, this is what's happening on that site. Maybe you should be there as well. That, that's the that's the idea. So um, this partner certainly wanted us to be able to measure their activity. Uh, however, um, unfortunately, they are pretty much a walled garden when it comes to uh, outside looking in. Um, Every every piece of activity that's occurring on that website um, between the um, the server and the, and the client browser is encrypted um, because obviously they they are they're very protective of the content that they that they um, that they actually show um, but um, but even the advertising activity was encrypted at that point so um, we entered into some conversations because they wanted to make sure that we could see their their data that uh, turned out to be um, uh, really, we went through a bunch of different uh, conversations on that. Uh, we were discussing, uh, you know, batch batch transfer of data, large volumes, uh, you know, trying to get that file, those files back and forth, um, and and that uh, none of those other options really made any sense. Um, you know, uh, there was a methodology. You know, how could we possibly do a sample uh, by pulling data from them and a, as a sampling methodology? Uh, the most the most logical answer there, of course, though, was truly doing a direct measurement uh, relationship. Now, uh, direct measurement is uh, is truly uh, using Beacon technology to to receive a notification of every single ad play uh, of every single visitor uh, to that to that major site. We would receive um, a ping with some indicative data, uh, no PII or, or no personal identifiable identifiable information, but we would know that a uh, a, a certain advertisement was played uh, at a certain uh, date and time. Now, uh, with this. Uh, with direct measurement, of course, comes certain challenges, uh, and infrastructure uh, is the first thing that comes to mind. We're talking about uh, truly millions and millions and millions of transactions, you know, between uh, 45 to 55 million transactions every day. Um, and of course, they're not all nice and smooth, of course, too. So you have uh, ebb and flow uh, throughout the day. Uh, we're talking, you know, thousands of transactions per second, depending on uh, on, on the time of day. Um, we needed to make sure that we were truly real time. There was not going to be any sort of um, impact on the consumer. Uh, we wanted to make sure that, uh, that, the, that we could handle not only just receiving all that data, but also storing it, calculating it. How do we uh, how do we sum and create aggregations on different uh, on different um, dimensions that were important to us? Um, you know, and of course, the big fear that that you have is, what is this going to cost? I mean, as as a, as a customer, it's uh, it's you know, how do I how do I invest in this to make sure that I can handle uh, this type of uh, capacity? And you know, what's it going to take for me to what do I have to build out? Um, and for not for today, but also looking forward. So it was pretty clear, you know, within within a few moments of of looking at this as a solution that uh, that the uh, cloud approach was the, really the only uh, the only reasonable. Um, uh, solution here. So, with us, we knew that we needed an elastic solution, right? So we needed something that uh, uh, could handle our, our scaled today, but also could scale if, if there was some sort of uh, additional um, uh, additional traffic that grows over time. Um, we we also knew we needed to be able to uh, to compute. You know, it's not just the capture as as one of the big things that Dan uh, is going to cover in a bit. You know, it's not just the capturing of the volume of data, but also how do you handle that data, manipulate it, and compute and, and extract the kind of meaningful business intelligence that you need out of it. Um, and, and that's what really was pretty clear that uh, we needed this solution. Now, um, um, I did a bunch of different, uh, you know, research with a, different, a bunch of different partners, um, and I'm sure, you know, if, if you're listening to this, you probably heard this already, but, uh, you know, Amazon, there's no no comparison out there when you're looking at the the capabilities of of uh, cloud providers for um, for compute on on demand. Um, they're years ahead of, of anybody else out there. So that was a pretty uh, easy easy answer. Um, I approached Amazon uh, with looking at this project as a how could I get something up and running that was going to get me meeting what I needed to do right away, but at the same time provide something that I could grow with. Uh, this is our first foray into into direct measurement um, and 
I wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to be a single project that was just going to be a, okay, well, that works, but now how do I adopt that into my internal operations, and et cetera. Um, so they pointed me to uh, ThinkBig um, as, a, as a local partner that, um, that could help us with this, and we created what was, uh, I think we called it a uh, proof of concept Kickstarter or something like that, um, where it was a, uh, a short-term engagement where at the end of the engagement, not only were we going to get an architecture, but they were going to help us assist build it out with my own resources so that it was really a, a partnership, not just a, you know, a contractor, hey, go build this for me and let me know when it's done, you know, uh, and then I can hope, hope I can read the manual. You know, <laughs> it, was a, uh, it truly was a collaboration. Um, and uh, so we kicked it off, and, and really, in a very short period of time, um, we had a, a functional platform. Dan, you want to go over um, how we went through and determined the requirements and, and actually uh, the analysis? Absolutely. Thank you, Will. So at the time, uh, Kantar came to us. You know, so at the time, Kantar engaged Think Big Analytics. They had an opportunity to work with a major video site, as uh, Will kind of outlined. But there weren't any hard specifications. Really, what we had were some key overall requirements that drove forth the need to uncover the best architecture for their uh, for the problem they were solving and, and the state of their organization. We'll talk a little bit more about how those two interplay in a little bit. But so overall, these big requirements are one is scale, right? Now that's a problem everyone hears uh, in the world of the web, in the world of big data. So we have you know distributed events from clients who are you know visiting this. Uh, video site all over you might be getting uh, I think I think the peak rate is around uh, 1200 events a second and throughout that you need a lightning fast response time so in the online uh, advertising space you really have to have a response time that's under 200 milliseconds and that's an industry benchmark that's critical for a number of reasons the biggest one is that in the web world, every millisecond that an ad is taking to respond is a millisecond or, or an ad uh, uh, tracking beacon is taking to respond is a millisecond that disrupts the user's experience on the site. And, and so fundamentally, it's a key aspect of user experience. The other side of it is really an internal industry metric. So you'll see firms that check each other out in terms of what are their response time. It's a way of evaluating competitors, potential acquisitions, potential partners. It says a lot of, about a firm or about their technology, their focus on computer, uh, excuse me, consumer experience, and again, kind of their willingness and ability to engage in that. And finally, we have a real need, as Will described, to be able to make sense of the data, to be able to perform analysis over it in a reasonable way. And those are going to cover a few different dimensions, one of which is the ability to really automate reports, have some analyses that uh, roll up on defined intervals and defined ways to be able to integrate both the reports and the uh, raw data into a production setting as needed, as well as perform ad hoc analysis. And so as we look at all this, this question of does the cloud serve us best? How do we make this decision? And that was one of the conversations we had had with uh, Will and the Kantar team very early on. And already, right off the bat, when you're working with ad data, there was a real gain from moving into the cloud, which was this notion of regionality. So we've talked about the need to have low response times. And here we're looking at a map. You can imagine if we're asking our uh, customers over on the East Coast to ask for responses uh, from a server on the West Coast, there's a delay to that. There's a certain latency and extension of the response time. But once you go global, you really feel it. So when you're asking people in China to ping over servers all the way in the States, you're introducing real latency, real response time delays that are just unacceptable. And so the solution in the ad, uh, online advertising space, be it video or otherwise, is to have local servers, to have edge nodes distributed globally that solve this problem, allow people to be geographically closer to the server their computer is speaking to. Now, there are a number of ways of doing that. We can, you know, invest up front in kind of co-locating servers and things like that. Will's going to talk more about the balance between investing up front and what you can do in the cloud. I'll simply hit it at the ability to have global presence up front over AWS was a huge win and a key reason to keep driving forward over that platform. Another reality. I'd mentioned this earlier that there's an interplay between current organizational state and systems architecture. 
designing systems is not just about having a system that works. It's about having a system that you can maintain given your current configurations and your current organizational skills. So one of the things you know, we talked about was that in particular, AWS as a cloud service, the Amazon Web Services as a cloud service, allowed us to have services in the cloud, not just hardware, not just operating systems, but as we'll see in a moment, kind of deeper, more robust services that will allow us to work with our data without having to worry about how they work underneath, whether we're talking about NoSQL solutions, whether we're talking about distributed queuing just as a service with a RESTful API embedded into the system, knowing that we don't have to take that DevOps ownership and worry about, well, who is you know, my systems administrator? Are they familiar with these technologies? How long will it take them to get ramped up and prepared to support my system, be ready to expand my system? Those are all challenges that start to melt away as we move into the cloud. So to that end, won't be surprised to find out that there are equivalent architectures in the cloud. So we can think of a number of ways of doing this solution, of driving this forward successfully that have just trade-offs in terms of their organizational impact, in terms of the complexity, in terms of the time to solution, in terms of their overall cost to maintain. And so what we I'm did so, with- I'm so proud of the whiteboard, by the way, Dan. Thank you. It's... <laughs> this is our deepest technology, technology right here, right, Will? Yeah. Cutting edge, that's what we use. Oh, yeah. So, so this is actually a, a live shot, if anyone can't tell, from uh, our phones on the whiteboard. So we sat around with Kantar. We spent a few days on site really ideating and then architecting potential analogous systems. And what you can see here are four equivalent systems we were kicking around. So, so the first one really leverages Dynamo as a NoSQL store as a way to store intermediate data quickly as beacons queue in and then get pushed into either S3 or kind of directly doing big data Hadoop jobs over Dynamo, which is a real possibility. Uh, the cost that was high and, and the need for real-time data, which is where uh, NoSQL stores like Dynamo really shine, was just not there. So we really focused on the two architectures below that. So you'll see uh, the middle architecture there is effectively a queuing system. So data comes in, it gets queued very quickly for fast response, and in the background you have workers that will push the data to S3. Now a similar solution to that is to use Flume. That's what you see at the bottom there. So Flume, for those of you who are un, uh, unaware, is a common big data tool for ingesting data at scale. And it effectively builds up a hierarchy of machines, all of whom talk to one another, kind of further aggregating data each step of the way until it's able to kind of push down very, very large chunks of data in efficient ways into things like Hadoop, or in this case, S3. The flip side of that is that these architectures, again, require a series of machines to set them up, and Flume is not provided as a service from most cloud providers, so there is DevOps overhead. And so we ended up deciding, kind of based off the Kantar organizational configuration, their need to be able to move quickly without having uh, large amounts of retraining and you know, reestablishing uh, folks' time, particularly around systems administration. Yeah, sorry, was to go with this final configuration. And so what you see here is a robust solution for very quickly ingesting beacon data. Over here on the left, data comes in through a load balancer. It hits a series of edge nodes which exist within regions. So in AWS, we have uh, both regions, and within those regions, we have zones. And, and so what we're always going to do is ensure we have multiple zones in each region. And for those of you who have uh, maybe heard the Netscape, uh, excuse me, Netflix story, there are scenarios where zones can go out, but regions themselves will stay up. Always one zone will be available. So as long as you duplicate your uh, data across zones, you have 100% availability. It's a great DR solution configuration. So it's exactly what we did here. The data pushes through from the edge nodes into the queue and immediately returns a response. In the background, we have worker nodes that are dequeuing the data and pushing it into S3 into log files. And then finally, we have an elastic map reduce, a Hadoop cluster over S3 that's working on generating reports. And the exciting thing about architectures like this is just how easy they are to scale. 
So if you look at the solution, the queuing, the storage in S3, the elastic map reduce, all of these things, everything that's been grayed out scales effectively for free. And all Kantar has to worry about is when the rates go up too high, if they feel the system's under strain, they can add new edge nodes, they can add new workers, they can horizontally scale the system with a push of a button. And that's one of the key stories about big data. It's about introducing these kinds of systems where we can horizontally scale. When we do it in the clouds, you can see we can greatly reduce our complexity and the total amount of oversight a system needs in order to be successful and have high uptime. So a final story about working on the cloud that I think is a very important one. A lot of folks, if you look here, we have two architectures. We have uh, effectively how AWS works. It's compute clusters over centralized data in S3. And on the other side, we have on-site uh, clusters, right? So, so you probably, many of you probably work with these. I've got you know hard machines that have both storage and compute and memory all in them. They're all configured into a, just a standard typical physical cluster. And when folks talk about the advantage of being in the cloud, there's a lot of discussion of, well, you know, things like Elastic MapReduce handle some of the nastier services like my name node and my job tracker and some of the stickier points of Hadoop. But it, it, it's also the case that, you know, it's very easy to add new data nodes. So it's easy to add new compute power. It's also easy to add new space. And those are great advantages of the cloud. I would never undercut those. But there's a deeper point that's really uh, important to appreciate. When we, do, we're, when we work in analytics, there's a need to be able to ad hoc query the data, to be able to touch the data, to be able to make sense of it, to find new insights, to pull and play with the data and see what it's telling us that's not already part of our existing systems, our existing production systems. And when we do that, sampling the data often isn't enough. So the notion of having kind of a small research cluster doesn't quite work because there's often signal that exists between data sets, between points where you have to have all of it in whole in order to have the accuracy, accuracy and the insights you really need. So at that point, there becomes a challenge that many organizations face, which is, well, running ad hoc queries over production is fundamentally dangerous, right? One bad uh, script brings down production. And in fact, you know, we've seen that. We've uh, been in situations where guys had uh, a missing shebang line on a pig script for anyone who's... Uh, more technical, uh, effectively, it tells the computer how to execute a program. And because that was missing, some syntax in a Hadoop file looked like it was a bash file, and they effectively inadvertently created a fork bomb. It was a typo in a file that caused them to bring down an ent entire production cluster. That's never a scenario you want to be. That's dollars lost, and, and it's a lot of hassle and a lot of concern for everyone in the organization. So. Do you pull aside a separate research cluster? Absolutely. But if you have to, as we see in the on-site, recreate all of the data, now you've got data mirroring challenges, which are fundamentally complex and they're also extremely expensive. And this is one of the really interesting things about building Hadoop clusters over S3, is you can have separate compute over the same storage. So you can store all of your data once in S3, have, you know, take advantage of the natural replication within S3, and then just spin up multiple compute clusters that all point to the same location, the same storage location on S3, in order to allow you to have a production cluster right next to your research cluster with fully mirrored data for free. And that's a really exciting and very cool capability of working with analytics in the cloud that helps people drive new innovations. And with that, I'm going to hand this back to Will to kind of talk more about the future and what they've been doing with the system. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, that is one of the newest things. Uh, just to echo that, we've already uh, we've already gained a whole bunch of uh, capability um, with being able to give uh, you know my, my data scientist access to a to a node and let him go and, and explore some of the early uh, early uh, findings in the data without actually having a risk that our our production jobs are going to be impacted by it. I think it's one of the greatest uh, advantages. Of. We love it. Um, so when, when we're talking about, um, you know, from a business standpoint, from a business benefit standpoint, uh, from a technology um, to te technology benefiting the business, you know, uh, I, I chose this photograph because I think it's uh, um, it uh, it really illustrates at least that traditional way of thinking of uh, how you had to scale your capacity 
and uh, it, you had to overscale, you know, you had to buy more than you need, that step function here, you know, with uh, uh, that graph there with the shadow shows that you would have to overpurchase capacity and then maintain and hope that your revenue would meet that capacity over time. One of the really neat, nicest things that we have, at least, is, you know, we have a platform now that we're able to add as many different partners on there as we'd like uh, to do this sort of thing. Um, and I can scale my capacity with revenue as opposed to, um, scaling and hoping for revenue. You know, you know that that's that's really a, a wonderful um, a, a tool in your arsenal. I think. Um, now, the other the other big benefit is the, the way that we design the architecture. Uh, we don't have to actually use. Uh, we don't have to use it for exactly the way it's constructed, or you know, just for web, uh, web, um, video, commercial beaconing. I mean, it, it, this actually gives us the capability to do uh, direct measurement in almost any form. You know, with uh, with us being able to silo the data using uh, allowing Hadoop to act upon um, the partition, the natural the natural partitioning uh, that occurs on on disk, um, we can use the same uh, infrastructure to to do direct measurement on a on a web page if we wanted to, or or a specific campaign or or survey with some of our part you know some of our internal partners. Um, it allows us to expand in ways that we don't even know that we're doing today. You know, it allows us to go ahead and grow. Um, in in many different future uses without having to uh, scrap what we have and rebuild. Uh, but I think really the biggest benefit to us, if, if we if you really think through it, um, is the the unlimited potential that we have in the data we're tracking, in the way that we're storing it, in the way that we're analyzing it that we haven't unlocked yet. You know, if you you do a traditional data gathering um, approach. You don't. You, you. You. One of the biggest things you have. You know, if you're your old school ivory tower uh, data uh, data guy, it's you know I, I need to figure out what I'm going to be using this data for. Therefore, I can store it in a certain way. Um, in using this this technology and this approach, my data team uh, can uh, explore the data and find new insights that we haven't even dreamt of yet. Um, and that's what I think is is one of the biggest benefit of all. There's no barrier at all to ad hoc querying, there's no barrier at all to uh, truly um, playing with the data and delivering or generating new potential innovations and insights. And I think that's yeah, that's all I have in here, um, uh, uh, Dan, I, um, that's all I had in, uh, to talk about. Fantastic. And, and so I will echo, uh, you know, not, not just the ability to perform ad hoc queries, but, you know, as part of that, kind of one of those stories of big data that always comes up and it's certainly worth mentioning in the context of online advertising as well, is storing all of the data in an unstructured form kind of takes away that problem of, well, which fields do I keep when I'm ingesting it into my RDBMS, right? So that's a really common issue when we talk about, you know, performing ETL, performing data ingestion uh, in organizations is back in the days of, you know, traditional RDMS warehouses, where we say, okay, well, I need to structure this data to fit into the columns. I have a limited amount of space. You tell me which fields you absolutely need. Instead, the story with big data, and particularly technologies like Hadoop, is we, we call them read time schemas. So you store all of the data, and then at that point you're reading the data, then you can apply a schema to it. At the time you're reading it, you can say, oh, well, I care about X, Y, and Z fields, and this is how I want them structured. And, and, and when we talk about supporting ad hoc analytics, being able to ask questions we never even thought about asking before, like Will was describing, that's a really important supporting technological aspect of the system. So with that said, we're going to call a few of the questions. Uh, a nice, simple one. Someone had asked what the name of the tool I was mentioning was. Uh, it's Flume, I believe. Uh, sounded like, thought it sounded like Fuma, so I'm assuming you're talking about Flume. So Flume is a data ingestion tool. It's F-L-U-M-E, and it's also bundled within the... Uh, Cloudera package, which there's uh, another question about what is the difference between Cloudera and AWS. And so at a high level, both use the Apache open source. And so effectively what's happening is they are very similar, except AWS is taking that Apache source, putting it into their cloud, allowing you to scale it as you please, spin it up, spin it down as you please. If you only want to cluster up for one hour out of the day to run a big analytic system and then pull it down, you can. Cloudera is designed for on-premise. So it's a uh, support solution over the open source tools. 
to allow you to run on-premise. And then they also provide uh, some very nice dashboards and other tools for maintaining the healthier cluster. And for those of you who are looking and playing with Hadoop, uh, I, I think you, know, you can get your first micro instance up on the cloud with AWS. They might even have a free option of that, uh, if I remember correctly. And certainly if you need a local one, the Cloudera tools are a little bit easier to set up. I keep that installed on my uh, Mac at all times. So there's a trade-off there in terms of, you know, hey, are you, do you need something to play with locally? Or are you looking for a solution where, as uh, Will said, it's one of my favorite lines, you, know, you can scale with revenue instead of hoping for revenue, which obviously is a great uh, aspect of AWS. So with that said, uh, another person asked how long it took to get the system up and running. We had this, uh, well, I guess it was about three weeks uh, in execution time. That right? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Actually, from uh, from the first day we got together and said, you know, uh, here's what we're thinking about doing, uh, three weeks later you deliver the run book. So, yeah. We do our best. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty amazing. I was pretty stunning. Uh, we did this um, just as a, uh, a follow-up. Um, this was not just a, a requirements gathering, go build something off-site and then come back and deliver. Um, I know I mentioned it was a little more than that, but to some more detail, uh, we did uh, requirements collaboration and then during the build process we did uh, uh, code reviews, you know, uh, all the all via online WebEx with you guys, um, uh, so that our our folks were actually uh, involved in the process all the way through it. So it was pretty, it was pretty pretty nice. And we did the turnover; it wasn't uh, blind. Yeah, and Cantar is a great team to work with. Uh, for those of you who are over there in Pennsylvania, uh, I would highly recommend the application. But uh, it, it, it's a great way to learn these tools is to do them side by side. It's really where the value is in, in taking the velocity of bringing in third-party consultants like Think Big and not just staying on the outside, but coming together and really having uh, you know, day-to-day -day interactions, touch points, and doing knowledge transfer uh, of both kind of explicit skills as well as a tacit knowledge that comes up in these uh, you know, little bugs or little day-to-day uh, -day analytics questions, really doing those together and making sure that knowledge transfer takes place. And it, it leads to another great question someone has here. Uh, so, so with all of that tremendous knowledge transfer that happened as part of this project, what, what's the real value of this data? What, what is Kantar Media Intelligence doing with this today? Oh, uh, right. So uh, it, it fits into our, uh, our, our, uh, our entire platform, our, our customer-facing uh, platform. We're a, uh, since we're, we're an entirely independent organization that monitors advertising activity, we have a whole bunch of uh, front-end products that uh, customers buy and they can get access to advertising, um, advertising data. Uh, with the with the video uh, metrics, it's you know uh, we know we, we brand everything down to a uh, multi-million uh, product database that we have across all 26 media. So we can answer the kind of question like, you know, what is uh, Pepsi doing on the West Coast to reach a certain demographic on you know, magazines and online video? You know, uh, so we we gather everything at the most granular level and we roll it all up so that you can ask those kind of macro questions um, with all the underlying data. So this is, uh, so what the value here is that we're getting census level data um, yeah, for, for this one partner uh, that allows us to even, even deeper and more, um, and more specific answers. Fantastic. And so with that, I believe uh, we've reached all but our last question and I won't say uh, where this question came from. But uh, folks are very curious to know, Will, where can we see you next? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm appearing all over the place. I'm sure it'll uh, <laughs> just, uh, uh, just follow me on Twitter, and I'm sure I'll, 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 uh, I'll cover that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you, folks, for joining our webinar. If you have any questions, Will and I's information is up on the uh, screen here. Feel free to email us, ping us, certainly uh, engage the Think Big website for additional webinars and insights around big data and R and data science. Uh, more and more will be coming your way in the next uh, month or two. So thank you, guys, and have a wonderful afternoon.